Good morning and welcome in the name of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ to this time of worship when we can come to him as we are, knowing that he will receive us in love. Now we're standing on the brink of Lent today. It's the Sunday before Lent. Last year, if you remember, we got halfway through Lent before lockdown bit. Now we'll be reopening our churches on the first Sunday of Lent. How it all will go, we don't know, but I'm encouraging you all to focus on Jesus this Lent, on who he is and what he means to us, because the more sure we are of him, the more confident we can be riding the storms of life. So let's be quiet just for a moment to consciously bring ourselves to him. And now our greeting. Our response is, awaken us to your glory. Dispel the darkness of night. Awaken us to your glory. Destroy our heaviness of heart. Awaken us to your glory. Cure the blindness of our sight. Awaken us to your glory. Heal the deafness of our ears. Awaken us to your glory. Restore a gentleness of touch. Awaken us to your glory. Encourage in us a sense of adventure. Awaken us to your glory. Bring us an awareness of you. Awaken us to your glory. Now we hand over to Wilma. So we're going to sing our first hymn now, just reminding us that wherever we are, God is present with us. Be still for the presence of the Lord. Be still for the presence of the Lord. The Holy One is here. Come bow before him now with reverence and fear. In him no sin is found. We stand on holy ground. Be still for the presence of the Lord. The Holy One is here. Be still for the glory of the Lord is shining all around. He burns with holy fire, with splendor he is crowned. How awesome is the sight, our radiant King of light. Be still for the glory of the Lord is shining all around. So now we come to our penitential. We're mindful of the things we may have said and may have done. Lord Jesus Christ, we confess we have failed you as did your first disciples. We ask for your mercy and your help. Our selflessness betrays you. Lord, forgive us. Christ, have mercy. We fail to share the pain of your suffering. Lord, forgive us. Christ, have mercy. We run away from those who abuse you. Lord, forgive us. Christ, have mercy. We are afraid of being known to belong to you. Lord, forgive us. Christ, have mercy. May the Father forgive us by the death of his Son and strengthen us to live in the power of the Spirit all our days. Amen. 
Now we're going to move on to the Song of Christ's Glory, uh, led again by Wilma and Rick. So there is a response to this and the response is, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Christ Jesus was in the form of God, but he did not cling to equality with God. He emptied himself, taking the form of a servant and was born in our human likeness. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name above every name. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and shall be forever. Amen. Now I'm going to hand over to Derek, who will be reading to us our two readings today. Our Old Testament reading this morning is taken from 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. Now when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, stay here for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, do you know that the Lord will take your master away from you? And he said, yes, I know. Keep silent. Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The company of prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, do you know that the, today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he answered, yes, I know, be silent. Then Elijah said to him, stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the company of prophets also went and stood at some distance from them as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up and struck the water, and the water was parted to the one side and to the other, until the two of them crossed on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I may do for you before I am taken from you. Elisha said, please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. He responded, you have asked a hard thing, yet if you see me as I am being taken from you, it will be granted you. If not, it will not. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them, and Elijah ascended in a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha kept watching and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. But when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. This is the word of the Lord. 
Now, to lead us into our second reading, going to lead you in the only hymn I know that's specially written for the Transfiguration, which is our second reading. So you may not recognize the words, but you should recognize the tune. Tis good, Lord, to be here. Thy glory fills the night. Thy face and garments like the sun shine with unborrowed light. Tis good, Lord, to be here. Thy beauty to behold. Where Moses and Elijah stand, thy messengers of old. Fulfiller of the past, promise of things to be. We hail thy body glorified and our redemption see. Before we taste of death, we see thy kingdom come. We fain would hold the vision bright and make this hill our home. Tis good, Lord, to be here, yet we may not remain. But since thou bidst us leave the mount, come with us to the plain. And now it's back to Derek for that reading about Jesus' transfiguration. Our New Testament reading comes from Mark's Gospel, chapter 9, verses 2 to 9. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. And then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it's good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. And as they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So, a word of prayer. And... Up on the screen now is one image of the transfiguration to lead us into this. But let's pray. Lord Jesus, open our eyes to see you, our ears to hear you, our hearts to respond to you. We ask this in your name. Amen. I'm asking the question at the moment, who is Jesus? Who is he to you, to me? Last week, Wilma focused on who Jesus is as the one through whom we're all created and sustained, as the one who redeems and reconciles all that has got messed up. This week, we've got the transfiguration, which, as you'll gather from that picture, is not actually the easiest of events to get our heads round. But let's ask ourselves again, who is Jesus and to keep asking that question, as we follow him through the events of Lent, we'll hear about his temptation, the opposition building against him, his death, and his resurrection. Who is this? And our answer matters, because if what Jesus says and is, is true, it changes everything. 
Now, throughout the first half of his gospel, Mark is showing us all that Jesus was doing, healing, his miracles, teaching, and so forth. And we're invited to stand with those who first had to ask that question as they witnessed it all. Who is this Jesus? In chapter eight, ahead of our reading, Jesus had asked the disciples, who do people say that I am? And then he pressed them further, but who do you say that I am? And Peter comes out with that answer, you are the Christ, but is then confounded as Jesus says he will suffer and die. This Jesus is different from the sort of savior expected and he just confuses them again. Now, the transfiguration is hard to picture, which is why we've got a few pictures today. Does it mean that Jesus had used Ariel to ensure that he was the whitest of white? Well, here's a few examples from the world of art. So this is the first one that we've had up for a while. I think personally that looks a bit wacky. Um, Jesus looks a bit odd launching himself into space. Then Wilma's going to show us another one. Now that's a much more modern depiction. Wonder what we make of that. It's hard to see what the artist was thinking of. Now Mark and the other gospel writers saw the transfiguration as good news really good news. So where is the good news today for us and for our world, particularly at this time of pandemic and disorder? Have a think. Now I'm going to witter on again. If I don't seem to make much sense, then do remember you can always rewind and listen to me again, which you can't in church. So let's go back to the Bible story where we're told after six days, Jesus took Peter, James and John with him and led them up to a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. That is hard to imagine. So I'm going to invite us now to look at an icon from the Orthodox Church, which hopefully the technology will now bring up. So very different from Western art. So. I'll try and explain something of it because icons are not art in the sense that we might understand them. So the idea is that when you stand in their presence, you're aware of gazing at the picture, but also of being gazed at by God. So it might just be worth focusing for a moment on that face of Jesus. Are you looking at him and is he looking at you? It's God inviting us in, working on us. So in this icon, Jesus is center stage, standing on a rocky outcrop. And if you notice, he starts standing against a dark background. And in, in the icon's way of depicting things, this is showing the depths of the dwelling of light itself, the depths of heavenly reality. And Jesus is depicted as coming out of the depths of infinity, as I say, out of the dwelling of light itself. Now, I wonder if you've ever seen the seven bore or a tidal wave, like particularly the seven bore, because it's that tidal wave that travels up the seven estuary into the river and the surfers ride it. And I suppose I'm thinking it's as if Jesus is coming out, riding the seven bore, of God's life and God's light. He is not created light, he is light. So he's coming out riding on that tide of God's love and God's infinity. Now that's an awesome vision of Jesus. It's saying he's not just a human life that points to God, for there are many human lives that point to God actually. And it's saying that he's not a supernatural life that's not grounded in the real life we live on earth. Rowan Williams would have it. Jesus is human life shot through with God. Jesus is human life shot through with God. So I wonder how we can picture that tidal wave of God's love and light 
flowing out into the world. I imagine that it's a wave like a river ever flowing out into the world, at work often at subterranean depths, but working everywhere. And I've always had the picture that our prayers join with that river of love and light, increasing its flow. I wonder how that picture sits with you, that picture of the unstoppable river of God's love and life flowing out into the world. The story goes on. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. So history is here in this picture too. Moses with the law, you can see him holding it, and Elijah the prophet. You heard in the Old Testament reading how he was taken up into heaven. Jesus stands here at the heart of history. If you like, he's upsetting the timeline that we know, for they talk to him in the now. They are not past. Somehow all come into the present. Notice the light on their clothes, which comes from the light in Jesus. The light flows from and through Jesus. Jesus at the heart of history. And somehow here, there's a glimpse of eternity. And we're invited to see things differently. And I think things will be very different from what we anticipate when we meet eternity. Uh, one of my silly terminologies is that one day we'll all be sitting on our fluffy clouds with our harps and we'll all be laughing ourselves silly because we'll say how easy it was and we made such a meal of it all. More soberly put, I think what we have seen as crucial may well turn out to be seen as insignificant and all sorts of little things that we hardly notice will have been the most significant. But for me, this event says that we can trust Jesus at the heart of history. All will be well and all manner of things will be well, but not necessarily as we would have done it. So Jesus at the heart of history. But then the story goes on. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say. They were so frightened. Basically, Peter has been turned to a gibbering bag of nerves. And no wonder in this icon that Peter, James and John are sent sprawling at the sight of all this. It's almost as if they've been chucked down the mountain at the sight of Jesus. It's all too much for them. If you look on the left, Peter is holding up his hand to shield himself from the light. The other two are just looking the other way. It's all too much. They're not ready for this direct encounter with the light and love of God at this point. And I wonder, would we have been any more ready for that sort of direct encounter? That's why often I think Jesus remains shy and shielded in our world. He knows the direct encounter would be far too much for us. Now, Peter, James and John were seen as the inner circle of Jesus' followers. So that was why I always learned, that's why they're taken to see this, because they're his closest pals. But I wonder if there's more to this. These are the same three who will be with Jesus in Gethsemane. Are they being shown his glory so that when they see his anguish and death, they will know that that was freely embraced by Jesus, all held in the infinite depths of God's life and God's light. The anguish and the death are not all a terrible accident. So where's the good news in all of this, in this icon, in the Bible? What is the good news that Jesus opens up to us here in the transfiguration? What I'm going to say may not sound good news to a generation that expects its problems to be fixed in an instant so that we can carry on business as normal. Jesus shows us here that God is God. There is no door closed to him. There is no bit of life from which God is excluded. At Gethsemane, he is there in fear and doubt. At Calvary, he is there in torment and death. He is not absent, 
God can live in the middle of death. Now, I know that raises the question for many, well, why doesn't he change things so nothing nasty happens? The answer is I have no idea. But here is a vision that gives me strength to live in the world in which we actually live, which is a mixture of good and difficult. God's love and light is everywhere in the world. That tidal wave is rolling ever out and through and round. As I say, no door is close to him. He is there. God can and does live in the middle of, of it all as he will live it out in Holy Week to prove it to us. Living with Jesus won't spare us trial and agony and death. That doesn't sound like good news, does it? But realistically, if it did, there would be queues of people lining up to sign up. We have to live in the world as it is, open to the truth that everything is open to God's love and light, however hard we find it to see. There is no escape from the world in which we are placed, but there is nowhere from which God can be excluded. He is at the heart of darkness, as well as at the heart of joy. So I would encourage us to pray and to learn to know that he is there in the middle of it all. To learn to watch for him in the small things is my experience, as you know. For as well as this magnificent picture of God, of Jesus riding the tide into the world, that same God is the God of small things. That's what I trust him for, for it's there I catch a glimpse of him that assures me that I can trust the bigger picture of his presence too. So I may have completely lost you this morning, which is why I say, if I have, have a listen again and see if I make more sense a second time round. So Wilma's now going to take, I think, that picture off screen. Uh, and then we'll go on with our service as Wilma's going to sing for us that little chorus, He is Lord. He is Lord, He is Lord, He is risen from the dead and He is Lord. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So now let us affirm our faith using the words of the Creed. Do you believe and trust in God the Father, source of all being and life, the one for whom we exist? We believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in God the Son, who took our human nature, died for us and rose again? We believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in God the Holy Spirit, who gives life to the people of God and makes Christ known in the world? We believe and trust in him. This is the faith of the church. This is our faith. We believe and trust in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. So let us pray. Holy Father, as we pray to you this morning, help us to know the glory of your presence among us and to see more clearly the beauty of your holiness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, you are the fulfilment of the law and the prophets of Israel. And in you, the hopes and fears of all people are met. Give us grace to receive from you all that we need for today and the coming week bring rest and refreshment when we are exhausted, hope and faith when we are despondent and doubt you, and the assurance of your love and forgiveness 
when we're overwhelmed by our own weakness and failures. Inspire your church today with a renewed vision of your glory so that we and all your people may walk as children of light and by your grace reveal your presence in the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, we pray to you for the life of this nation with its joys, its sorrows and its wrongdoings. We pray for a world in disarray at the moment for many different reasons, for natural disasters and for pandemic, and for all the suffering. We pray for all those who are involved in the administration of justice. Give wisdom to all those in authority over others. We pray for all the world leadership that they may have a true vision to move our countries forward. Reveal among us your glory and power to bring resurrection and new life, even out of deepest sufferings. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, as we go about our daily routines this week, Help us to see your glory in the people we see, whether that's virtually or in person, for our neighbours and our friends, and in those we fear or find hard to get on with. In all our conversations, help us to listen carefully, not only to what others are saying, but also to what are saying in each encounter. We pray for the young people of our community who begin the holidays this week. Keep them safe and be strengthening presence in those families where the holidays bring difficulties in coping and put additional strain on relationships. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, you know what it is to experience the joy and wonder of God's presence and then go down into the depths of despair and suffer rejection and pain. So in a moment of silent prayer, we give thanks for your compassion and bring to those in the needs of those who are in our thoughts and hearts today. For those who are unwell and struggling with many things, problems, anxiety, depression, and illness. Help them and us to know that you are with us when we descend from that mountain top, that although your presence may be hidden from us, you are still with us in the power to bring comfort and healing of body, mind, and spirit. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray for those who are now with you in eternal glory. As we rejoice in the fellowship of those who now see the fullness of your glory, be with us in our journey and transform our lives with the promise that you will grant us with them a share in the eternal kingdom. And again, just in a few moments quiet, bring before you those who have died, those who will die alone today. And for those who remember but see no longer. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise because the greatness, the power, the glory, the splendor and the majesty belong to you. And you reign with the Father and Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. 
And so now our colic for today. Holy God, you know the disorder of our sinful lives. Set straight our crooked hearts and bend our wills to love your goodness and your glory. In Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So let us pray with confidence as our Saviour has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. So we're coming to the end of this service now. Just a reminder that Wednesday is Ash Wednesday, so we will be doing a Zoom service um, and we'll be sending out the details of that. Um, if you know you're not on the email circulation list, then don't be afraid to contact me to get the link to join in Ash Wednesday on Zoom. Uh, it seemed better to do that service that way this year rather than in church. But then next Sunday, we will be back in three churches and moving around again as before. But now our final hymn. Come, let us join our cheerful songs with angels round the throne. Ten thousand thousand are their tongues, but all their joys are one. Worthy the Lamb that died, they cry, to be exalted thus. Worthy the Lamb, our lips reply, for he was slain for us. Jesus is worthy to receive honour and power divine, and blessings more than we can give, be Lord forever thine. And now the peace of God, which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.